In today's video, the most requested revision to my most popular project, as we have a look at the AD5X from Flashforge. Today, by the doorstep, we have an entire box worth of Flashforge. This is the 85X nestled in a chunky bit of foam, some of which is destined for the studio. Actually, the studio is in the opposite direction. Outstanding. Good interns are so rare these days. Here's the initial look at the machine itself, and it is an open frame Core XY design with a build volume of 220 millimeters on all three axes and a unique multi-material solution. Minimal assembly overall, and upon power up, we navigate the language selection, Wi-Fi, some trouble joining the 2.4 GHz network, ultimately resolved by joining the 5 GHz network, and as such, we advance to some initial calibration. Here, you'll notice the nozzle and the build plate temperature slowly creeping toward its target. However, by the time I set up for this next shot, both readings were already on their way back down without the machine having done anything at temperature. Nevertheless, the calibration continued as we took the dog out for an evening walk, returning, some 45 minutes later, to the same screen with the readings now hovering at room temperature. So that's just going to be a do-over, and in the interest of expedience, we'll skip the Wi-Fi entirely. Once again, however, as the temperature climbs, there's a faint click as though something's switching off, followed immediately by a drop in both temperature readings. As a matter of due diligence, I repeated this several more times, each time bringing the bed temperature slightly closer to its target, until eventually the machine was inclined to proceed. The final step is a dual filament calibration coin, so here's some Flashforge branded PLA, and it just clicks into these spring-loaded rollers, goes up in there like that. On the screen, you select the type and the color, push next, and off it goes, laying down the base layer of the coin along with a tiny wipe tower. Here's the first layer of orange, and in no time at all, we cross the finish. Everything appears to be in order, so let's move on to the customary 3D benchy. However, only seconds after launching the print, I noticed the temperatures coming back down. PC load letter? What the f*** does that mean? This isn't going to be worth a damn. In fact, after weeks of silence from Flashforge followed by some rather disjointed communication, I come away unimpressed. Sorry fellas, you've had my interest, now you've lost it. And with that off my plate, it's on to the feature build. This is one of the very first 3D printable enclosures that I made available for download. It is based on a single 3-inch subwoofer from Tangband, and it uses an acoustically tuned waveguide to dampen the tiny driver with about 2.17 grams of equivalent air mass, resulting in a fairly usable near-field extension well into the mid-40s out of something that intuition suggests should not produce any bass at all. Needless to say, ever since that project, I've been asked to develop a full-range variant that would reach the highs and still perform like there might be a tiny subwoofer hidden away. Well, the challenge here lies in the fact that, for all intents and purposes, these are subwoofer drivers, and despite the tiny piston area, or even the low inductance, they exhibit a substantial high-end roll-off. Ordinarily, this is where a mid-range driver would fill the gap between something like that and a tweeter, but in 1969, this became a thing. Vintage hi-fi enthusiasts will recognize it as the Dynaco A25, and not that you can tell by looking at it, but this was an impressively broad-range tweeter. So impressive, in fact, that you can still get a replacement. Now, manufactured by GRS, this $30 special carries well into the lower mid-range for a comfortable crossover with the little tang bands. Introducing the A25 Micro, capable of the same 50Hz through 16kHz frequency response as the full-size classic, yet small enough to print on something like the 85X should yours happen to work. Internally, the enclosure relies on a mass loading arrangement similar to my original, now damping the driver with 2.31 grams of equivalent air mass along this meter-long acoustic waveguide. There's also a pair of hidden bypass channels between the compression chamber and the back of the enclosure to route all the speaker wires directly across. A tongue and groove interface joins the two main halves, with the drivers mounting right into the faceplate. The subwoofer, inset flush along the front, and the tweeter, loaded from the opposite side, to fire through this high-frequency waveguide for approximately 3 decibels of boost above 1 kHz. In fact, given how compact I've made things, the two drivers actually overlap. 
Last, and arguably the least, along the underside there is a 75 by 75 mm bolt pattern for something like a speaker mount or even a pair of feet to bring up the angle. And given that I'm obviously not making in headway with the 85X, we'll simply advance to where I've already printed everything on a different machine. This is Bamboo Labs High Flow PETG printed with 4 parameters all the way around and a 40% gyroid infill, making the enclosure exceptionally solid. Prussian orange for the faceplate, same settings, and here supports were used for the underside of the tweeter inset. This is where I sync a few threaded inserts, 4 M3s for the tweeter and 6 M4s for the sub. Afterwards, 3 more M4s along the face of each half and 2 more along the underside. Next, it's onto the speaker wire, and routing it couldn't be easier. I simply feed it in here, and seconds later, it emerges right by where the binding posts go, keeping the low-frequency waveguide largely clear of any turbulent obstructions. Though, before any assembly, let's quickly test the high-frequency waveguide. Here, I'll just unplug a portion of my benchtop stereo, swap in the probes, and configure channel 6 with no processing other than a 500Hz high-pass filter with a 48 decibel per octave Butterworth slope, just to prevent any potential damage to the tweeter, which I will now load in backwards such that it sits flush with the baffle and the input terminals protrude through the waveguide. An RTA microphone is positioned in the near field, and here's how the tweeter fares unassisted. Now let's flip it the right way around and perform a second sweep, this time with it properly horn-loaded. As predicted, there's our 3 decibel boost up of 1 kHz in effect greenlighting the next stage of the project. This is where the main body of the enclosure comes together with a healthy application of JB weld deposited along the groove, and an even healthier application of Doug deposited along Sophie's face. This is followed by some ratchet bars, one per corner, and as such the enclosure is left to sit overnight. Afterwards, the subwoofer is lined with a thin gasket of reusable adhesive and mounted into the baffle. Another gasket along the tweeter landing, mostly to keep the low frequency pressure from leaking around the flange. The components are wired in, and the face baffle seals to the enclosure by way of this third gasket, with the 6 M4x16 screws along the face delivering the squeeze. This is where I enable channel 5 with no processing and run the subwoofer sweep. The results show a usable frequency range of 50Hz through 1kHz, so that's just a simple bandpass filter, simultaneously positioning the new high-pass value for the tweeter one full octave above the initial safety cutoff, and with only a 14 decibel pad, it carries flat through 16kHz, very much in line with the original Dynaco A25. What's more, I can still give it some broad Q boost around 20kHz for a slightly less hooded top end. This just leaves the feet, once again dampened with reusable adhesive along all contact points, including the foot pads themselves. Now I'll just take this banger of a photo and post it on X, where you might have already seen it well ahead of the video. Here's Sophie gluing the other enclosure together, followed by me getting the remainder of it intact. Up next, I'll want a total of four channels, with the second pair set up exactly the same as the first, and while I could have obviously applied some custom equalization, I am happy enough with how neutral a response can be attained with barely more than a couple of high and low pass filters. So let's do a listen. And in the spirit of the original video, which as you'd imagine is not monetizable, then again neither is this one, we'll begin with Shed.
That's what I was hoping. Did you fool the stuff? Go back and tie it up tight. She told me don't worry no more. Ah! Oh, that was cool! Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. And I like that you can still get the room noise of the song, so you can hear his fingers rubbing the strings. Just not having a subwoofer in this entirely just it does throw me because I'm I'm listening, expecting it to be like on the floor back there, but no. Just got little little space right there. And that's it. That's everything. And that's everything. <laughs> And and holy shit, that's cool. Yeah? Yeah. All right, good times. So, I don't really have a lot to say about the AD5X. Obviously, you should expect yours to work and there's no shortage of videos online to support that impression. So, let's maybe have the project be the ultimate takeaway this time around. In fact, if that is what you're here for, that's literally my entire back catalog. Just skip ahead of the boring shit and watch another cool build complete with demo. Speaking of, if any part of this or future video should happen to fall under some restriction, I now post an independent copy to my X account. In fact, you can go there now and watch the rest of the video about me stuffing six 4-inch subwoofers under the floor of my car. All the STL files for today's project are available in printables, so if you were looking for a tiny set of DIY computer speakers, there you go. Don't forget to rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.